Hello and welcome to Clare College Digital Gala Week. This is our first event and I'm delighted to be welcoming you all virtually to Clare, especially at this time where travel and events in, in the college itself are so difficult. Uh, so it's lovely to have you here. My name's Katie Astley and I'm the Interim Deputy Development Director at Clare. Before I introduce our speaker, I just wanted to talk through a couple of items of housekeeping. Uh, this session is being recorded and the link to tonight's talk will be up on uh, the Digital Gala Week website by tomorrow morning. So please do feel free to share this link with anybody that you think might be interested in Charlotte's talk. We will be allowing plenty of time at the end of the session for questions. Uh, please do feel free to log any questions as you think of them as Charlotte's talking. You can use the chat function to do this. And at the end of the session, um, we will, we, I, will, I will feed those to Charlotte and she'll have plenty of time to address those. So it just remains for me to introduce Charlotte. Um, Charlotte Kingston graduated from Clare in 2008 with a first class degree in English. And she then went on to pursue an MA in Medieval Art History at the Courtauld Institute of Art, and also an MA in English and Medieval Studies from Yale University. Charlotte is now the Head of Interpretation and Design at the National Railway Museum, which is part of the Science Museums Group. Charlotte is responsible for the way that the museum communicates its stories and inspires its visitors through exhibitions, displays, and permanent projects, including the Vision 2025, which is the National Railway Museum's master plan to become the world's railway museum, telling the past, present, and future of our global railways. Before joining the Science Museums Group, Charlotte worked as an interpretation developer and writer for exhibition design company, Ralph Applebaum Associates. In tonight's presentation, Charlotte will explore the history of the National Railway Museum, talk us through why it was founded almost 50 years ago, and the journey that it's been on since then. She'll look ahead to the museum's plans to transform their physical site, to tell new stories and inspire the next generation of engineers, thinkers and creators. So Charlotte, thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, I uh, couldn't have put it better myself and I think it's always one of the amazing ironies that I've got um, three degrees in the humanities and I've ended up working for a science museum group so um, it's always something I find uh, quite amusing at least to myself um, but I mean as I'll go on to say a little bit about um, fundamentally museums are all about stories and a humanities degree does give you a good grounding in stories. Um, I'm going to share my screen and show you some pictures hopefully so um, um, hopefully this will work. So I trust that's all working well. Uh, if, if it's not, just please interrupt me, otherwise I'll get going. Um, but I just wanted to say, first of all, good evening and thank you very much for joining, um, joining me tonight as I tell you a little bit about uh, the museum I currently work for and actually from which you currently find me right now. I'm in the office um, and uh, overlooking the East Coast Main Line outside my, my window and uh, enjoying the beautiful collections which are all sort of located downstairs uh, at the bottom of my office door, which is very exciting. Uh, it's lovely to be back on site um, in a small way at this present time, having been uh, not in the museum for so much of last year as we've all been apart from the places we love. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about the NRM, um, as it's sometimes colloquially called, or the Railway Museum. Um, and some of you may know this museum and some of you may never even have heard of it or know where it is. So I'll tell you a little bit about kind of how it came to be um, uh, and the background to it, some of the kind of important early collections. And then I want to take you on a bit of a journey into the future with me. And uh, so you can imagine uh, where we're hopefully going to end up and hopefully inspire lots of you to come and visit and enjoy what we've got to offer. So yeah, as Katie said, I studied English, um, but I've ended up working in exhibitions um, in a really public way. And I really enjoy that public aspect of my work. Um, the National Railway Museum is part of the Science Museum group, as Katie mentioned as well. Um, and, and I mentioned a bit about how fundamentally our museums are all about inspiring futures and about telling good stories. And those authentic stories, I think, are really, really at the heart of what we're trying to do here in York and in our, some of our other museums as well, because science and 
technology and engineering and maths, the STEM subjects as they're sometimes called, they're not cold, inanimate disciplines. They are histories in their own right. They have protagonists, they have conflicts, they have resolutions. Uh, they have all the hallmarks of uh, regular stories as you might like to think about them, um, but they just uncover a different aspect of our world. So I want to just start, oh, if I can get these slides to move on. Oh, there we go. Um, show you just some pictures of our museums. Uh, there are five museums in the group and one collection center. So uh, you can see the biggest image here on the slide is of the Science Museum, which many of you will be familiar with um, if you're uh, from, from London or know London well. Um, huge range of collections, uh, medicine, um, healthcare, but also space um, uh, and, and, and many, many, many other things besides great, great clocks gallery as well. Um, then we also have the Science and Media Museum in Bradford, which is devoted to the technologies of sound and vision. Uh, we have uh, the Science and Industry Museum in Manchester, which tells Manchester's particular um, story uh, around the Industrial Revolution. And then we have the Railway Museum and Locomotion. Um, I'll say a bit more about those two in just a moment, both of whom have share a director, my, 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 my line manager, um, Judith, and uh, we are both devoted to kind of trying to excite people about the railways past, present and future. We also have a national National Collection Centre in Swindon, um, which is uh, just outside Swindon, I should say, which is an old RAF base. Um, we've been there for, for many, many decades, um, but we've just invested in a brand new building there as well to house some of our extensive collections and make them more accessible to the public. So our railway museums, Locomotion in Shildon and the National Railway Museum in York, and I've popped them on the map here just to um, help everybody's geography. I know mine could use a little work. Um, really we're in the unique position of being able to tell the past present and future of the railway story but in the country and in the region where railways first began and became successful i go around the world sometimes not not these days but i used to and go and visit some uh, lovely railway museums and they would always have a gallery or a section of their museum describing the early origins of the railway story. And we don't do that in, in, in York or in Shildon at the current moment because of various, various good reasons, but we're trying to do that. We're trying to show how actually our sense of place, our rootedness in the Northeast of England is really important to the stories we're then going on to tell. Um, and for those of you who want a little detail, uh, you might know that uh, the Stevenson's rocket um, was, was birthed in Newcastle and that was the steam engine that kind of set the, set the precedent, set the patent for, um, set the model um, for all steam engines that came afterwards. Um, and then we also have the Stockton and Darlington Railway, which um, I have to always check what I say about this, but it's the world's first steam powered public railway. So although there have been earlier railways, of course, this is the first one that kind of operates, I suppose, in the way we know it today. And the very first train from that actually left from Shildon, not from Stockton, as the name might suggest, left from Shildon and went to Darlington um, in 1825. And that literally departed only 200 meters away from our museum in Shildon. And the story of early railways is also bound up in the history of the Science Museum group. So when the Science Museum was first founded in the 1860s by the Patent Office, among the first items that it collected were Stevenson's rocket and other early locomotives like Anginoria, Samparai, Puffing Billy, um, and you can see a few of those uh, on display here um, from an early part of the 20th century. So we might ask ourselves why a national museum in York? Perhaps it's not a very exciting question today because actually the answer wasn't very simple. Um, it was the first national museum in England to be located outside of London, the first national museum to be located outside of London uh, in England. So that's quite an extraordinary move to say, we're going to take some attention away from the city, um, from, 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 from the capital, um, and move it more towards uh, what I suppose might have been considered then a secondary city. Um, so this is, for example, this is the uh, Clapham Museum of Railway Transport. Um, but actually, until 1975, there hadn't really been there hadn't been a national railway museum. There'd been attempts to found one in, UK from, in the UK from the end of the 19th century um, and then under the various railway companies, the big four as they're sometimes known, collections were sort of brought together in quite an ad hoc sort of way, but it wasn't really until the nationalisation of the railways in 1951 that a consolidated approach was suddenly more possible. Um, and in 1961, this museum, the, the British Museum of Transport opened in Clapham and was really, really popular. Um, but then 1968 came, a proposal was made to remove the management of museums from British Rail and to establish a National Railway Museum. And several sites were looked at, but the York site was deemed to be most appropriate. 
Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about two of the strongest advocates, because I think it's really interesting that we now have the first female director of the National Railway Museum in post, Judith McNichol, um, but actually among the very early railway, uh, the, the early supporters of this railway museum were two phenomenal women. Um, one of them was Dame Margaret Weston, who established not only the NRM, whilst she was also director of the Science Museum, but also the National Science and Media Museum in Bradford. She was responsible for that too. And then Jenny Lee, who was Minister for the Arts under Harold Wilson, and she defended the museum's move northwards, despite the fact that there were a number of MPs, I think 122 with, um, was the, was the, uh, the figure I found, um, who vociferously protested uh, the move north. Um, one apparently saying that it would be inconceivable that people would travel all the way to the provinces to visit. Um, and I think just sort of quoting that um, or <laughs> paraphrasing that just goes to show how um, how much uh, the, the way we think about culture has changed and how a national museum in a city like York's is, is seen as unremarkable now, I would say. Um, still, still something we want to claim and, and celebrate, but um, a lot less uh, divisive than perhaps it would have been back then. Um, and in fact, it was tremendously successful. In 1975, uh, uh, we achieved uh, around 2 million visitors that year. And just to put that in context, um, we, we welcome around 760,000 visitors usually in a normal non-COVID year and around 200,000 at locomotion. So not, I mean, really good visit numbers, but not the 2 million of, of 1975. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about our site and our buildings, that, that important sense of place that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, so. The museum effectively moved into old railway buildings, uh, a number of practical reasons, but also there was space there. The, the, the railways were starting to uh, rethink how they did things. You might use the word decline. Um, and so there were these empty buildings that could be available for this sort of purpose. So our site um, broadly extends here. We started off as a museum in the York North Shed, um, which was called the, uh, the York North Engine Shed as well. Um, the concrete works uh, was until very recently a part of our site, the stable still are, the good stations still are, um, the wagon works sit at slightly outside our, our site but obviously you can see from the wagon works, the south shed, the carriage works, all of those um, all of those buildings speak to the sheer scale of this industrial complex um, and it's a very distinctive teardrop teardrop shape as well you can I sort of sometimes think of it like a like a whale um, but it's 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 often known as a teardrop uh, site um, and and this was really the place where locomotives were built and maintained uh, they it also housed a really substantial goods industry um, so our goods station is a rather grand goods station um, for its type it's not a sort of ready rough and ready building it's it's got a beautiful facade it's actually the building I'm in right now um, which is quite exciting um, so you can really kind of see, um, I mean, I love, I love um, this, this shows the, uh, the outline of the site um, against, uh, against that, um, uh, against that backdrop again, you can see the, the, the distinctive teardrop site there too. And I love this picture because this East Coast main, this is still the East Coast main line. This is the bridge that you cross if you go up to Newcastle or to Edinburgh. Um, you will go past this, you will go over this infrastructure. And um, the fact that you've got a horse there as well really speaks to the fact that um, the freight industry was such an important part that the railways would bring the freight in, but then the freight needed to, needed to unload and go somewhere else <laughs> and so horse-drawn uh, transport was used for that and our stables are really interesting because we have some of the oldest um, stables still existing on railway land um, and we've recently made some moves to repair their roofs and conserve them. So I just sort of want to paint you a picture of the site in 1880. Um, this is an artist's impression of how it would have looked. Um, and you can see on the right hand side that that goods shed. Um, you can see the left hand side. Sorry, the right hand side is the engine shed. The left hand side is the goods shed. And then in the foreground is um, a massive coal drops network. So a place where coal, the, which was basically the energy, the fuel for the railways, uh, was kept and distributed. Um, and then I really love this uh, 1921 aerial view, which shows you a bit more detail about the uh, about much of this infrastructure. Um, you can see the complex roofscape of the 1870s uh, York North Engine Shed in the top left. You can see wagons entering the coal depot on the bottom bottom left, and this lovely curve of York Station, which if you've been through York Station, you'll recognise instantly. It's a very very dynamic and very distinctive architecture. 
Uh, this is a slightly later image, but this is actually inside Station Hall, or sorry, it's the goods shed, um, as I've called it thus, thus far, we now call it Station Hall. And we've still got these distinctive roof trusses, as you can see from this picture, um, which is uh, only taken last year or two years ago or so. Um, so you can really see how that architecture is still so important to our atmosphere and to the stories we tell and to the collections that we have. Um, they are in need of some attention though lately, they are not, they haven't withstood the test of time, but I will come on to that. Um, so then jumping ahead by say another, another 70 years or so, um, we're now uh, coming to a point where this is still a place where locomotives are maintained and looked after. It's not yet a museum. Um, we've got new buildings that have grown. We've got some additional uh, storage sheds. We've got the stables that now appear, although they were that they were earlier than 1959 um, and you can see uh, you can just sort of see the scale of this kind of growing and and the station itself also extending as well um, I want to show you some lovely images of, of the engine shed. So this is the, North, the, the, the York North engine shed. Um, note the distinctive uh, hoods over the locomotives to extract the steam. Um, and much of what is there on the floor, on the ground is still intact today. So we still have the same track layout. We ha still have one of the original turntables um, in situ. Uh, the uh, roof, however, is quite different. So you can see from this image, and if you've ever visited the museum, this will look familiar to you. Um, this is the sort of the money shot if you Google our museum. <laughs> um, so you can see here that we do still have that track layout, but obviously the roof has been replaced um, with a much, much, much uh, higher roofscape as well. And although I don't love the colour of the steel, it is very distinctive. <laughs> So if you're interested in finding out a little bit more, just a little plug for something we've been working on um, during lockdown, really. Um, we have a new audio tour, um, which is uh, QR code led. We're all QR code experts these days. So um, I don't feel too uncomfortable about introducing them here. Um, and you can use your own device and your own headphones and walk around our site and listen to some of the sounds and the histories of the past and um, hear different voices from, from around, the, around the site. Because I think this history is something that we haven't been able to tell as yet and this is a, a way in which we're trying to do so and you can also find these on our website as well. So jumping ahead to 1975, so this really is now seeing decline in steam power, the rivalry of road, there's no need to have such, an, such a huge industrial railway complex in York. Um, and so this is when the museum moves in. Um, and so I just want to show you this fabulous image from the 1970s of our entrance, which currently serves as our entr entrance for conference guests. Um, and I also want to show you this, uh, this image of Great Hall in the 1970s. This is our turntable, again, a, a different roofscape um, and I believe those hoods are fiberglass replicas not the originals um, if anybody's if anybody's checking um, and this is a, another image of that great hall um, shortly after opening um, showing one of the Liverpool and Manchester replica carriages as well so um, so we start to move in as, as a museum and then by 2016 actually we had um, not only expanded from the right hand side of the site but we'd also expanded into the left hand side of the site into the goods shed um, we built a new entrance which is indicated by the red arrow um, and uh, we'd, we'd started to expand also into the into the railway land behind both of those buildings um, where you can actually go on go on train rides today and we have a miniature railway also there too. So one of the things you might notice about this diagram is the presence of a road down the middle, Lehman Road. And, um, oh, sorry, forgive me. I, I had one more slide just showing the, the entrance and the name above the door and the thing that you'll see if you come to visit us. Now I'm gonna look ahead and think about the road. So just, just bear that image in mind. Um, and you can obviously see if this is taken from um, the footbridge that crosses that road. It's a fabulous vista. You get this wonderful view of um, this central building, which I haven't mentioned yet. It's called the Bullnose Building. And it used to be the mineral office. Um, so a place where mineral quality coal would get checked. Um, and it's got this wonderful curved shape, I'm told, because horses would find it more efficient to uh, carry their, uh, their cargo past it so I, I really love that 
Um, but one of these things that I want to just highlight is the presence of this road. Now, when you've got a railway site, an industrial railway site, having a road down the middle of it is not a problem. It's great. In fact, it gives you lots of access. It gives you um, the ability to move your stuff around much more uh, easily and take deliveries. Um, but unfortunately, as a museum, it poses some quite significant operational problems for us. Um, and more importantly, it's much harder for visitors to cross the site. Uh, so we currently have an underpass that's served by two lifts. Um, these often break down um, and it doesn't provide level access. So if you've got a buggy or if you've got or if you're in a wheelchair, it's far from ideal. It's also quite cold and unpleasant in the winter and it makes it more difficult to move objects safely across as well. Um, so you can see here again an aerial view. I hope you can see the sort of alignment of the museum, those two larger buildings um, at the front and then that curve of that road and then tailing off to the, to the teardrop in the background. Um, so what I want to talk about now is that um, the teardrop site we've been located on has been largely underused for a couple of decades by now, um, but it has just very recently been granted outline planning permission as part of a project called York Central, sometimes referred to as the King's Cross of the North. It's uh, one of the largest city centre brownfield regeneration sites in England. It's really close to a rail link um, and the city centre, so it's quite a it's quite a ripe opportunity for development. Um, and York Central, which I'll just show you a short, a, a very, very um, uh, it's not a great visual of it, but it starts to give you a sense of the scale of development that we're expecting on this. And it's going to deliver around 2,500 homes, a business district, which is shown here in red, um, and a really nice large green spine, a green park that will end up flowing into the back, um, the backyard effectively of the museum and create a porous site with our communities so that we can welcome in people who perhaps maybe don't think a museum is for them, but would love to come to a great play area or a great park. Um, so we can offer them that as well. So work has already started and one of the key changes it will make, I'm just showing you some pretty pictures of, of York Central, <laughs> um, one of the key changes it will make is the position of that road and that will relieve traffic on some adjacent residential areas to the west of the museum and will also provide, and this is very nerdy and technical, um, uh, effectively what's an unrestricted height access to the site because do you remember that photo I showed you of the bridge with the horse underneath getting a car getting a lorry getting a bus under under that it can be really challenging um, and and we're, we're, at the moment our teardrop site is pretty much landlocked and the only access is by two by, via two roads both of which have quite severe height restrictions. So the creation of a new access road into the teardrop site will enable us to bring in, um, well, anybody to bring in anything on a lorry or a, or a bus or whatever it might be. Um, so our museum and our visitors also stand to benefit from this change because we will be able to unite our site physically for the first time in our history and provide level access for everyone. And I, I can't stress how important that is that we can, we can do that with our spaces. Um, and this just gives you a sense of that uh, rather unlovely underpass on the right hand side um, and the, the challenge we're faced with as a result of having the road through the middle of the museum. So this is what we're going to do. Um, we have commit. We have been working with um, an internationally acclaimed architect, uh, Field and Fowles, um, and both founding members are both Cambridge alumni, which I. I sort of knew, but I, I, I confirmed today and was really excited. So, so it's really, really exciting to be working with such an exciting new practice. Um, they've designed us a building which we're calling Central Hall, and that will bridge the two halves of our museum. It's really inspired by railway architecture, both turntables and rotunda and roundhouses, which are distinctive features of, of, of the railway architectural typology. Um, but it also draws on some quite traditional museum typology in a, in a way as well. The station and the museum have a lot in common, it turns out, or the railway architecture and uh, the museum have a lot in common. Um, so this will do two things for us. Uh, one, it will properly give us a welcome that is worthy of a national National Museum. Um, I think you can see, uh, I've already spoken about the uniting of the site. And the other thing it will do is give us a new gallery, which will be all about the future of the railways. So that will be about showcasing the latest innovations from the rail industry, um, giving them, uh, giving people a sense that they can get involved, uh, painting a picture of the kind of work that the railways can do, and trying to take a really long view on this as well. Uh, I want children to come to this place and dream that 
they uh, that they that they would want to come and work in the railways rather than say go and work for NASA or or for um, or for Apple. I'd like them to think, do you know what? Actually, the railways are just as exciting as as, as those other those other technological companies to work for. So it will be a bit of a game changer with how we present ourselves to the public. Um, and I just sort of want to show you a couple more of, of, of images of how it will, how we think it might look. Um, this image is, in fact, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but my office is literally right there <laughs> at the moment. It won't be in the long term, um, but it's quite exciting to think that one day I might be looking out my window and, and, and seeing this fabulous building growing up. Um, and it really does look spectacular. Um, and this image from within um, the rotunda obviously the collections are all just just illustrations of what might go in there but that sense of grandeur and openness um, and I want to take a moment here to talk about the sustainability of the building as well um, we're going with a timber structure um, and some very sustainable uh, heating options as well so it's it's really trying to be um, as light as it can be for a new building um, whilst also delivering uh, to the brief that we've set out so, oh, I, I, just before I flick onto the next stage, I mean, this journey to try and become a, a museum of railways past, present and future is already starting to change. We're already starting to make some changes in our public programmes and our exhibitions in our learning offer that we put out and try and get some more of that um, narrative coming through. Um, but it's also flowing into some, th some of the other projects we've got going on uh, beyond Central Hall. And I just want to touch on those a moment. Um, the first one is at Wonder Lab. Um, those of you who have kids, uh, you may know that Wonder Lab is a thing uh, if you've ever taken them to the Science Museum. Um, we actually have three Wonder Labs in the world. We have one in London at the Science Museum, we have one in Bradford at the Science and Media Museum, and we have one in Queensland in Australia, um, which was a, um, a partner project for us. Um, and really these galleries are for seven to 14 year olds to get hands on and discover what they don't know and what they do know and have a go, try something out and all of these interactives are based on scientific principles um, so our wonder lab in york will be a little bit different it'll be based more on the engineering principles but they share lots of overlap with each other as well um, we won't be having slides but i do love the fact that these slides show uh, the effect of friction um, if anybody needed that image explaining <laughs> you can you can slide race each other down there and see which one is the fastest um, so yes, yeah, so our Wonder Lab is well underway and that will actually open in 2023. Um, and although I said it was for kids, uh, it's pretty popular with the adults too. And uh, we, do, we, we will be available for evening bookings should you be interested. Um, and then I also want to talk a little bit about how we're investing in our collections um, and in our, in our collection storage, uh, getting things undercover where they haven't perhaps been undercover for a very long time. Uh, the thing about rail vehicles, they're really, really big um, and we tend to have a lot of them. <laughs> and so finding space with them is quite hard, <laughs> um, but, we, but, we, but we do need to care for them. And so part of our investment is building a new collections building at Locomotion, which will house around 45 vehicles. Um, and really, really bring some much needed um, addition space uh, to space in that uh, in that part of the world. It's a very small town, Shildon, um, and uh, if you don't know it, it's really, really worth a visit. Um, it's a lovely, lovely place, uh, but that will effectively double the amount of covered visitor space that's available. Um, and then on the left hand side, the two images on top of each other, there are our Great Hall and Station Hall. We're also investing in new exhibitions, telling more personal stories, more um, inventive stories, and really trying to bring out why, the, how, why and how the railways changed our lives. Everything from the reason we drink milk um, in bottles that comes from a cow in, in the in the countryside all the way through to why we even have time and a unified sense of time across the country. Um, so those will be the kinds of things that you'll discover in Great Hall and Station Hall. Um, and then lastly, uh, we will be investing in our outdoor spaces, as I mentioned, with that new green park coming into the back of, of, of our museum. We have an opportunity to transform what's, what's a fairly inaccessible piece of land filled with railway tracks um, and uh, lots and lots of weeds at the moment um, into making that a really beautiful railway park um, where everybody can come and relax and enjoy themselves. 
So as we, I'm not going to move on to that one just yet because it's got text on it, it'll be difficult. <laughs> so as we move closer to 2025 and our ambition to become the world's railway museum, we are striving to be both a part of our communities, but also to be a much more relevant museum for people. I always think, um, I read the TripAdvisor comments and, I, and they always say things like, I didn't think I'd enjoy it, but I had a lovely time. And I just want to get rid of that bit at the front of the, <laughs> of the sentence. Uh, so people know and expect quality and get quality and really enjoy themselves whether they're um, passionate about railways and have been all their lives or whether they're um, a young family just coming to look for a day out um, so I think we really want to connect people into this story of innovation and change um, and what's really interesting is that this is a, a time when the railways themselves are also experiencing a huge amount of change and investment as well um, if you look at the three biggest engine or the two biggest engineering projects of the last two centuries the first you could argue was the foundation of the railway network uh, in in the early part of the of the 19th century the second you could argue is the Eurostar and the Channel Tunnel um, and then uh, potentially this decade this, this this, this century could be the development of HS2. So those are three massive railway projects, uh, massive engineering projects. Um, and we need more engineers. We are facing a national shortfall of engineers, qualified people who want to come into this industry. Um, so there really does feel like this, this is the right time to be uh, making, this journey, making this journey and changing our story and showing how uh, really the, 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 I mean, at one point rocket, Stevenson's rocket was a completely crazy idea. And wouldn't it be incredible if we could inspire somebody coming through our doors to think of something that would shape the future of, of our railways and the future of our world. That's what we're really here to do. Um, and I'm just going to end my presentation on this lovely quotation by H.G. Wells, um, which I think for me really sums up kind of my journey into engineering. And he writes, there is nothing in machinery, there is nothing in embankments and railways and iron bridges and engineering devices to oblige them to be ugly. Ugliness is the measure of imperfection and therefore beauty is probably the measure of perfection. Thank you very much. I would love to take any questions and share more. I could talk about this all day. Well, thank you so much, Charlotte. Uh, you said right at the beginning about how science is not dry, but it's the source of narratives and stories of its own. And I think you've really brought that to life for us by example tonight as well. So thank you very much. Uh, we do have some questions coming in. Um, so I will just fly fly straight in if, if I may. And I'll, I, might, I might sneak in a couple of my own if there's time as well. Uh, so the first question comes from Sue. Uh, she asks about funding, because obviously you've talked about a lot of investment um, and plans for the future. So, yeah, could you talk us a bit through how, how that's funded? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll talk a little bit about how the museum is funding itself, and then I'll talk a little bit more about York Central, because they are funded quite separately, um, and they're, they're two different kinds of investment, I guess. Um, so the Railway Museum's master plan is uh, set at £55 million, and we're already over halfway through that. Um, we, have a num we have a funding strategy that's made up of um, a whole range of uh, different inputs, really. We have some, some investment from government, which was secured a couple of years ago, actually, long before COVID came along. Um, and we have some um, additional trusts and foundations bids. We have a number of individuals who have given, um, and we have a strategy which will see uh, the, the various other channels um, kind of woken up um, at, the, at the most appropriate time. And there will probably be some element of a public funding campaign towards the end as well, um, in, in, in what I think is a fairly typical uh, way of doing the funding. Um, and that 55 million does cover a huge amount. It doesn't cover everything, but it does cover a, an extraordinary amount of what I've talked through there. And we really are kind of looking to invest really appropriately because it's a sensitive culture, for, a, a sensitive moment right now to be investing large amounts of money in the cultural sector. Um, so it's definitely about delivering that, that really best value for, for the investment we're making. And then just on the York Central side of things, um, that additionally, that, that's been um, a, a, a plan that's been talked about for several decades, I believe, in York um, and achieved uh, planning permission in, I want to say, 2019. Um, and that was the outline planning permission. And, and that, because it's a partnership, it's being delivered by a partnership between Homes England, Network Rail, who are the landowners, uh, the City of York Council and ourselves as the sort of cultural gateway to the, to the development. Um, 
um, that's been a, a, a sort of a really strong message, I think, to uh, both uh, private and public investors um, that this is going to deliver real change and, and really good value change as well. Um, that has secured some government investment to do the infrastructure works like the roads and the rail links um, and those kind of nitty gritty pieces and the rest of it will be developed um, in due course. I'm, I'm interested to know, will you have to shut the museum itself when you get to that final stage of, of development? Oh, it's such a hot topic. Um, our commitment Sorry, is not. Don't. No, 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 no. Our commitment is not to. Um, right. uh, we're going to try and keep as much open as we can and tell the story of our change as we go through it. Um, I can't promise that we won't be closing parts of it. Um, and and gosh knows. I, I mean, I don't think we'd wish another museum closure on our either our colleagues or our visitors. Uh, it, and um, and we're only open five days a week at the moment as well. Um, and that will remain the case until next March. Um, so I think uh, yeah, a closure is. It, is, is not what we want. <laughs> of course, thank you. I have another question from Roger, Roger Stokes. Um, he's asking about your future exhibition and display plans. Mm. Uh, specifically, uh, will you have a display on alternative motive power for where electrification is too expensive? Everybody's That's talking about electrification all the time at the moment, aren't they? Absolutely, yeah. I, I mean, we're definitely not ruling anything out. Um, and if if Roger is an engineer, or uh, perhaps knows some engineers that he'd like to introduce me to, we're definitely taking. Uh, to, <laughs> my black book is filling up. Um, no, we, we we're working. Um, actually, I mean, right now, even even as I, as we speak, I'm actually working on a bit of a pilot project, which will start to lay out some of those themes and narratives for the Futures Gallery as part of Central Hall. So I'm effectively developing a, a kind of risky, uh, less that suck it and see kind of approach to displaying innovations from the rail industry and building those connections. So we're working with um, research centres like the one in Birmingham. We're also working with Network Rails Research and Development Department. Uh, we're working with uh, some companies as well to try and understand from them what's really exciting for them right now um, and power is absolutely a hot topic i mean it, it, hydrogen is that what we're going to go down is it going to be um is it going to be the hyperloop the, the suction is it going to be a maglev um interestingly we have the, the world's first maglev in our collection it's sat in the great hall um probably not doing its best at the moment. Um, it's an extraordinary technology, which obviously the Japanese have used to great effect. So I think we're really open to telling all of those stories and showing how some of those past visions or dreams of the future, um, some of which have come about, some of which perhaps haven't, um, and some of which maybe could still. So definitely uh, part of my thinking. It's a really important topic. Thank you. And I have one other question actually circling right back to the beginning of your talk when you talked about your own background in humanities and then the fact that you've come to work in the science sector. Um, and I, I just think that's a very interesting message there, both for people who are studying now in terms of what options they might have open to them. Uh, and I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about how you how you moved through your career and how you found yourself in this design and exhibition space, because I think it's something that um, it tell, again, it tells a really good story that I, I think students and alumni alike would would be uh, would benefit from hearing. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's hard to sort of make a make a map of something that happened fairly organically. Um, I, I, I never expected to come and be working for this museum. I really didn't. Um, and I think it's been such a joy and, and, and a privilege to be given this opportunity to shape the future direction of this museum. I guess I, I, I've always been interested in spaces and objects and how they interrelate. And bear me out for a moment. Um, the medieval cathedral is actually a really good metaphor for this. <laughs> Uh, which I never thought I would say, but the medieval cathedral is a space where you've got artworks, stained glass, books, you've got music, you've got sound, you've got different spaces within each other, you've got thresholds that you cross, and as you uh, as the liturgy is performed within that, um, the space starts to change its meaning. And I can't think of a better kind of way of describing an exhibition. I'm getting away from your question, but all I'm saying is no, that- No, no, not at all. I think it, it strikes again back to what you were saying about how you can have similarities in architecture in very different types of spaces. It's the same yes. kind of idea, I suppose. A absolutely. So, so I guess the sort of the thing that's running through my life is always that interest in how spaces and objects interrelate. And when I was at Cambridge, I did. I worked at Kettle's Yard a little bit. 
it just as an invigilator and an events assistant and I mounted some exhibitions in the college chapel and uh, had a really nice nice time doing all of that I sat on the Clare Arts Committee and um, sort of pretended I knew what I was doing um, but I think in little ways all of that kind of led to then me I, I went to work for a festival for a while um, which was very stressful but also quite fun um, and then ultimately realized I wanted to work on permanent things and so um, was able to get a job with with the company you mentioned Ralph Applebaum Associates who design exhibitions and I didn't realize until I really found out about them that that was a discipline that you could go into and and the company that museums don't design these things themselves in-house sometimes they do but mostly for the big things they tend to contract that out and working with them for five and a half years was an absolute absolute privilege and they really they, they, they got me to work on all sorts of different projects across the world really and I think that was my training ground um, and then set me up to do to do this really. Thank you that's that's fascinating it's always yeah like you say the organic journeys and where they lead us. Um, I do have one more question which uh, is it sounds like a bit of a, um, a suggestion for future investments from Alistair, Alistair Hughes. He comments that your sites are so close to each other and he he wonders if you might consider at some point going down the route that other national museums go down of having their collections more widely spread nationally uh, and he suggests a Swindon branch <laughs> I don't know if he has a personal interest in 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 access from Swindon but uh, I guess that's another question is because you talked about that new site um, is there any and you talked about accessibility to the to the material on that site I, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about if there's any plans to to make more public access of some of your other spaces I have many answers to this because there actually is a railway museum in Shildon and 98% of its collections are the railway museum's collections. <laughs> so yeah. um, so it's called no, Steam. Sorry, it's Swindon. Swindon. Sorry, sorry, did I say Swindon? I meant to say Swindon. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, you said there Shildon. Is, oh, sorry. I meant to say Swindon. There is they a railway sound museum so similar. in Swindon. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's called steam and it's right by the railway station and you can go to it and 98 percent of the collections are from the railway museum sorry oh, forgive me right. i misspoke no, no, so there is fine. one there already uh, now we don't operate that museum we don't own it it's, it's run by the council but it is a really lovely museum and it has some fabulous objects in it north star being um, i mean my absolute favorite is the broad gauged brunel locomotive is absolutely incredible it's huge um and then we have a collection centre, as you mentioned as well. Um, so there, there are plans. That it, they're, they're still early days at the moment, but um, they used to do tours of the hangars around there. And the intention is to is to enable people to tour the collections in an in an organised uh, way. And and at, at some point uh, in the coming years, that will become available. Um, but as to the point about sharing collections more widely, it may surprise uh, the questioner to know that actually um, we are the biggest lender of rail vehicles, operating rail vehicles. And static rail vehicles in the country. Um, so we have, um, I believe it's around 50, I, I want to say 50 locomotives on loan at any one point to various heritage railways and other heritage bodies um, around the country. So actually there are quite a number of rail, of, of rail locomotives that you can go around the country to see. Um, I have intentions to make a map of where they all are, but um, they do keep changing. So I think it would be a, a constant work in progress if I were to start making such a thing. Um, and I think the other thing as well is we do share and share things. And another example of how that's happened is Stevenson's Rocket, which I've mentioned a few times, had been on display in the Science Museum since the 1860s with a couple of trips various places here and there but it had been there in the making of the modern world gallery as an icon and by the power of being part of the science museum group we were able to discuss it moving to first to Newcastle for a short visit then to science and industry museum in Manchester and finally to York um, and to our museum and that's that'll be where it will be on permanent display um, in our 2025 world oh, so um, so again we do share things we do move things around uh, we've also recently brought back an important locomotive from Darlington to Shildon only nine miles down the road but again a really important locomotive for that for that museum story as well I hope that answers the question um, I, th I think it certainly gives us all a summer holiday plan to go around and tick off all the various locomotives on loan around the country and ride them good. all. <laughs> Yes, that's like a good project. <laughs> and we and we have locomotive. We have many other things in our collection. I mean, actually, our, our rail vehicle collections are. Let me get this right. 0.0014 percent of our overall railway related collections. Wow. So we actually have a whole load of other things as well, which are yeah. also quite quite exciting. So wonderful. 
Well, that's whetted our appetites for, for lots of cultural visits when we're allowed again. So wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, if anybody else has a question, may I ask you um, to share it now? Otherwise, I think I will wrap up um, with a huge thanks to Charlotte for sharing your fascinating career and a really interesting insight into how such an important cultural institution works sort of on the inside and the outside and as part of a wider kind of cultural part of of the country and York in particular so thank you very much for sharing that my pleasure I just I've just noticed that Sue's question perhaps is a little bit more general than I was wondering do, do you mind if I just circle back to sure, it really yeah. quickly it, it's because I think she, she, she writes how is the NRM funded and I suppose that what I talked about was the investment um, part of the funding the capital works but actually our day-to-day -day funding is a is a real mix of um we make our own money by having a business so we have corporate um corporate hire we have we have events in normal times we have cafes and shops uh, we have a donation so people give um sometimes when they come into the museum sometimes they give legacies sometimes they give big gifts little gifts all all are fine um and we also get a grant in aid uh, from the government as well so i just wanted to clarify uh, that's you. how we fund our day-to-day -day. thank you um uh, so thank you again, Charlotte. Sorry. And no, no, that's that's lovely. And, and we've got some thanks coming through from the audience as well. Um, and I'd also like to thank all of our participants for joining us tonight. Um, it's been it's been great to to have you all here uh, for our first event of Digital Gala Week. Uh, may I encourage you to come back for more? And like I said, to uh, look up the link and share that uh, with your friends uh, tomorrow. Uh, so yes, thank you very much, everybody, and goodbye. Thank you. Bye.